Good morning, everyone. Let's begin our time of worship together. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Well, welcome. Glad you all could be here this morning. Um, especially if you're visiting with us, we're grateful to have you with us this morning, and I'm just glad that you are you are able to share in this time of worship to our Father together. Um, as we dive into our worship this morning, I'd like to reflect on the words from, from Psalm 68, especially in light of the song that we're about to sing. I'm going to read a few verses out of this uh, out of this Psalm, verses one through five, and then down in 19 and 20. And reflect on this about the nature of our God this morning as we come before him in worship. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. And down to verse 19 and 20. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this time together as we celebrate our God is that he is a God who has all the power in the universe, who has all the holiness in the universe, and we have no right to come before him except that he granted it to us and loved us enough to save us. As we come in his presence this morning, I'm humbled by that. It's something that I just can't help but give him my praise for. So let's stand. Um, as we sing and a song straight out of the words of this Psalm 68 together. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love, our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. 
Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. His enemies will run for sure. The church will stand, she will endure. He holds the keys of life, our Lord. Death has no sting, no final word. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Our God is a God who saves. 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 Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Be seated, please. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Father in heaven, your children has come together this morning to lift up your name, to give all praise to you. Father, this is a time of year in our calendar year when we reflect back on the year that has passed. We can reflect back on the challenges, the struggles, but Lord, most of all, we want to thank you for the overwhelming blessings that you poured upon us. Father, you've been very good to us. We thank you for helping us with our struggles. We thank you for protecting us and providing for us. Lord, we're so thankful to be in your kingdom. And Father, we want to thank you for the shepherds that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the work that they do. We thank you for the deacons. And Lord, we thank you for the teachers. And Lord, we thank you for the preachers that we have. Father, we ask that you please continue to be with those who are physically ill. We pray, Lord, if there's any pain, that it be eased and their bodies be healed. Lord, be with us this morning as our brother Jeff presents the message that he has prepared. We pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds are open wide. And Lord, as we use this day also to reflect, may we reflect on some of the seed that we have sown in the past year. Maybe, Lord, some of that seed could be cultivated. Let us look for the opportunities. And Lord, going forward, we ask that we be able to run into open hearts to receive your word. Oh, Father, we want to thank you most of all for Jesus and the debt that he paid on the cross for our sins. 
Father, we want to thank you for the great future that we have. No matter what happens in this world, we have a future that's everlasting. And it's better than we can imagine. And we thank you, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You are holy, you are mighty, you are worthy, worthy of praise. I will follow, I will listen, I will love you. All of my days, I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love and adore you, and I will bow down before you. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love and adore you, and I will bow down before you. You are my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy, worthy of praise. I will follow, I will listen, I will love you all of my days. I will sing to and the King who is worthy, I will love and adore you, and I will bow down before you. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy, I will love and adore you. And I will bow down before you. You're my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. After the song, Brother Tim's going to lead us in uh, communion. Um, simple enough song that I think we've all known. Uh, I've known it for almost my entire life. Uh, I remember singing it as a kid in, in Bible class have to throw a wrinkle in there, of course. Um, we have been, for, the, for several months now, practicing occasionally singing songs in both English and Spanish at second service, because that's where most of our Spanish-speaking members attend. But that's not where all of them attend, and we even have numbers uh, in, our, in our first service. Spanish is their heart language, their first language. Um, and this is a song that's very easy to translate back and forth into Spanish, and especially a song that we all know that we can sing by heart, no matter what the words are on the screen, when we hear the tune, we know what it means. And so let's sing this together. We're going to sing it in English. We're going to sing it in Spanish and share that together with our brothers and sisters that that's their heart language. And then we will repeat it again in English, and then Tim will come forward and lead us in communion. I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Te amo en el amor del Señor. Te amo en el amor 
Santo é o Senhor, e o véu em si, a glória de mi rei, e te amo no amor do Senhor. I love you with the love. Last week was kind of dreary, would you say? Would you agree? Lots of rain, lots of darkness. Um, it, it creates issues. If, you've, if something comes up, it, it's more difficult because now you're trying to do it in the wet and the dark and all that. Uh, welcome to introduce you to Tim's world. Um, that's usually when things, when the truck breaks. <laughs> um, Mon uh, Tuesday, Monday we were off. Uh, Tuesday I go in and and uh, things were fine, but when I backed out from work, the, I heard this grinding, like rust fell into the brake drum, except I don't have brake drums. I have disc brakes in the back, and I heard this grinding, and I backed, and I thought, oh, no, what's that? And immediately I'm thinking oil seals and bearings, and, uh, you know, I put it in drive, and it, it went away. Okay, That's, I'm good. So go on home, you know, and, and the next day, Wednesday, I'll go in, didn't hear anything. Wednesday night, put it in reverse. It's like, oh, this is terrible, but it's raining and it's dark and you're going to get me home one way or the other. Don't, you know, and it went away again. Oh, wow. So, okay, I'm getting geared up and, and this is a three-day weekend, so I do have some time I could... Okay, gear myself towards, let's find a bearing, find a seal, get the tools. You got to, you know, have a bearing puller and all this and that. So Friday, I'm all kind of anxious about having to spend my three, next three-day weekend working on the stinking truck. Yesterday, I get it all in. I had to clean the garage out, you know, to get the truck in. And... And then I jack it up and everything, get the wheel off, and and I'm looking and see Wednesday night when I looked under there, I could swear there was a patch of oil on the tire, which indicates to me the seal's broken. It wasn't there yesterday. What the heck was I looking at? And I get to looking at the seal, and there's it's dry. I grab the axle and try to shake up and down, and it's fine. Well, I have to wrestle with the idea that I was wrong first, <laughs> and that all that anxiety, I can let go now. That's really strange. I have some rust in there, the back plate's rusted and stuff, and I guess that was what was going on, but... Put it all back together, and I think I'm okay. I think I'm comfortable and confident that that's not the problem. You must know, Keith, that you prayed it, that your future is eternal in a good place. There was a time when I wasn't so confident, and I had even a little bit of anxiety about it about what the future held. It's going to be difficult. Preachers say it all the time. <laughs> Life's a hard road and, and you're going to struggle. And we ha might have a little anxiety about it. When I was 16, I asked my mom, do you, the preacher said it, do you know that you're going to heaven? Well, if I cross all my T's and dot all the I's and I get there and it's a good, a good report. Now it's about my 30's and I heard again about this knowledge. This knowledge that you, that you should have based on 
your commitment, your covenant that you made with Christ, the, the work that Christ did, nothing that you did, but that anxiety should not be there if you have it. Let me read you something. John says in 1 John 5, Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. It's there in black and white. We should know. And we should never be anxious about our eternal future. And like I said, it wasn't. it's not because of anything that I'm doing. Because if I cross all my T's and dot all my I's, you know, it's uh, kind of worthless in comparison to what Jesus did. And so I thank him for his work in my life. And according to what this says, I believed, I was baptized, I confessed, I repented. And I don't need to keep reminding him every time I go to him in prayer, forgive me of those things that I've done. You remember, right? He doesn't remember anymore because his idea of forgiveness is forgetting as far as the east is from the west. So we don't have to be anxious about those things that we've done. We can have confidence knowing that he forgave us and his idea of forgiveness is forgetting. We can have that confidence. We should have that confidence. And as we come to him in communion, it's not the right word, we, we consume him, we, we, we eat his flesh, we, we take in his body, um, we drink his blood. It, the blood, if you will, mixes in with ours, and it, it's it's life that flows through us. And it's because of, again, what he did, that we can have opportunity to make memorial of this, eating and drinking his his body, his flesh, and his blood, so that we can know, be reminded one more time that we have a life of eternal salvation with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for <clears throat> continuing to be patient with us when we get anxious. If we do, I, there's times that I question my confidence in that. But help me to know, know more rightly every day and, and be confident in it every day that we take this communion, that we are in you if we have clothed ourselves with you in baptism. Thank you for what you've instituted here for this service, that we um, eat, the, eat the flesh and drink the blood. And it's in your son's name. Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> and Lord, we thank you so much for the for the love that you showed, your determination to finish the work when your blood was spilled and your life left your body. We know that your life is eternal and you gave that to us. As we drink this now, we ask your blessing on it in Jesus name, amen.
Let's sing this song together. Um, I'm used to singing this as a round. I know it's difficult for us to do that, but let's try it. Uh, I'll hang with the center section. We'll start off, and then side sections come in after we get to the end of Adore You. Father, I adore you, and I lay my life before you. Oh, how I love you, Jesus. I adore you, and I lay my life before you. Oh, how I love you, Spirit, I adore and I lay my life before you. Oh, how I love you. Hey, good morning. This uh, looks like uh, less of a crowd than it was described to me last week in one service. Uh, but we're back to normal, and it is good to be here with you. I'm thankful that we are still doing two services. Uh, we want to welcome you if you're joining us online. We're glad you're doing that. If you're a visitor, we're really glad you're here as well, and we'd love to know something about you. Then the, there's instructions on the side screen. It's got to get used to a little bit of a new way that we're trying to do the slides, so I hope this will not be too, too crazy as we uh, figure this out going forward. I, I should also note, uh, Ryan and I both picked up Christmas colds, I think we're both on the downside, right? I don't know if you got yours. Did you get yours in Tennessee and bring it back? I, okay. Well, you've been back to Tennessee a couple of times recently. I actually took, I actually got my cold here and took it to Tennessee. So if you brought yours back, we sort of even things out. I gave it to my sister. We had a great Christmas hacking on each other. So, so we are kind of in voice preservation mode this morning. We're both, he's worship leading, I'm preaching. We're both teaching. So uh, hopefully, you, I guess you get the benefit of the full voice as much as they are uh, when we get started today. But it's good to be here. Uh, I did want to say thank you very much uh, for the very generous Christmas gift. Really appreciated that. It really meant a lot. Um, and I wanted to, I'm sorry, my, uh, let's see if my slides, yeah, my clickers. Can somebody, get, can you give me a battery? This may be one of the things that as we try to, try the new Robbie's push, positioning the thing. I need a couple, uh, I need a couple of uh, AAAs if you can find them. If not, I'm going to have to tell Robbie to advance slides today. So, Happy New Year! <laughs> Change is good, right? With change, all, change always goes smoothly. Uh, I was over there uh, trying to wash down the grape juice, which tickles my throat, spilled a bunch of water on my lap right as the song was ending. So, you know, these things happen. It's the way things go. Um, and I, oh, wait, okay, that worked. So we'll see, we'll give it a try. December 31st, 2003, that's today. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for the generous Christmas gift. Thank you to the elders for you know, letting me go away at Christmas. I know that's uh, it's a tough time of year to be away in ministry. Uh, thank you to Ryan for jumping in and preaching last week, doing such a capable job. And I hope that uh, if you were not here, I hope you could go back and watch uh, his message from last week. And I hope each of you are experiencing the, the deep spiritual peace that he described. You know, the peace that we get through the reconciliation that, that we have in Christ, through, you know, the completeness and the wholeness that we have being part of the body of Christ. Uh, there is no peace like it. There never can be peace like it in a world of chaos and in a world of uh, turmoil. That is the peace we want. And so I think, Ryan, I think I'm working. So hang on to those. We'll see if it dies. I'll probably swap, swap them out before second service. So anyway, yeah, 2024, we're on the cusp of 2024. It's a couple hours away. Uh, New Year's Eve is kind of a pivot point for me. You know, it's a, it's a time when we, we typically look forward, but we also look back. And you've heard a lot of probably New Year's sermons over the years. I have tried to do something New Year's oriented every year. Um, I'd actually like to do a little of both today. I'd, I'd like to look forward a little bit. I'd like to look back a little bit. 
Uh, and I want to start with uh, a look forward briefly this morning because I want us to be able next Sunday, January 7th, to hit the ground running with something that I think is really important that we're going to start the year with. So one of the things that we've been talking about for a while, off and on, and I'm sure you've noticed if you've been in this church for any length of time, is how much this church has changed, how much our congregation is different. And if you've been here even just a couple of years, you probably have noticed. If you've been here you know, as long as Marty and Margie have been, for example, or Jim and Jackie, uh, you notice big changes in this church. But in particular, the last couple of years, things have sort of accelerated. We've had the COVID stuff and the culture is different. The world is different. Churches are different. And so uh, one of the guys that I read fairly, fairly often, his name is Tom Rayner. He's an author. He's a uh, church consultants. He writes volumes of stuff. He does a lot of surveys and studies. They study across denominational lines. And, and one of the things that, <coughs> excuse me, that he pointed out recently is that every year, if you were in a church, a typical church across denominational lines, for every 100 people that you have on a typical Sunday morning, the average church over the course of the year will lose 32 people. Think about that. For every 100 people you have on a Sunday morning, the average church over the course of a year will see 32 people essentially disappear. Now he breaks it down. He says one of those people will die. Seven of those people will transfer to some other church in the community. Nine of those people will probably move somewhere outside the community. And probably as many as 15 people in an average church will just stop attending or stop attending as often and so you will notice tangibly a reduction in people. So 32 people out of 100, meaning that a church post-COVID, a church that is staying in place, a church that is not growing numerically, but just treading water, will have to replace a third of its attendance over the course of the year. That's a pretty shocking thing, isn't it? Now, we have not experienced that exactly, although we have certainly had, uh, you know, we've had our losses, we've had our gains. Uh, we've had people who have left for various reasons. We've had many, many of you are fairly new to this church since COVID. We're glad that you're here. Um, that is not, you know, the, the difference in our church is not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's just one of those things that happens. And it's something that we've got to deal with. It's something that we've had to deal with up to this point. And it's something that we have to deal with going forward. One of the things about a change in membership though, is that we forget sometimes that from time to time, we need to reestablish and reemphasize who we are and what we believe. Because there's a constant uh, influx and outgo of people who maybe know that, maybe don't. We forget, we assume, we just kind of think, well, they'll absorb it if they're here enough, but that's not really good enough. And so, uh, and this matters a lot because the thing is Christianity, Christianity is a faith system. It is built on certain beliefs uh, and those beliefs are non-negotiable. And so for you to be a part of a, a true Christian church, if you, for you to be a true Christian, what you believe matters. And what we believe collectively matters. And so we need to talk about this. Now, you may be, you may be a part of this congregation or you may be attending here because you have some friends here. You may be here because you have found some kind of, you know, uh, community here and you've been looking for that. The world is looking for community. You may be here because you have been drawn to some sort of ministry activity or service opportunity that exists here. I, I hope those things are all true for each of us. I hope that those are things that you like about this church. Uh, and so if that's why you're here, that's fine. But to be truly part of this community, to truly be a part of this spiritual family, there are some core beliefs that we all must hold in common. But they're non-negotiable. We don't have to hold every belief in common, and we'll talk about the differences. That's really important. But some things we do, if we're going to be in this together as a spiritual community, there are certain things that we have to be walking in lockstep on, things that are non-negotiable. And so from time to time, one of the things we need to do is go back over those things. We need to talk about uh, getting all on the same page. We need to make sure that if you're here and you're not on the same page, well, at least you know who we are. At least you know what we believe, what we stand for, so that you're not here under any false pretenses or you can't say later, oh, I had no idea that, that you held this belief as a church. No, we want you to have that information. And so the truth is we haven't really done this in a while. 
We should do it more often. I don't know how often. You're not, we're not going to do this you know, six months out of every year. That's too much. But we need to do it more regularly than we have. And since we've added some new faces in the last couple of years, we're going to give this some special attention here right at the beginning of 2024. And so how we're going to do that this year, I don't know, right way, wrong way, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do a sermon series combined with a Bible class. And they're going to walk hand in hand. So this is what we're going to do. We're calling this... We're calling this class, we're calling this sermon series, The Essentials. Uh, and here's how it's going to work. Basically, what's going to happen is that I have eight topics that I'm going to preach on over a series of eight weeks, starting next Sunday, January 7th. So I will preach on a subject. And then, for reasons that I will we'll go into more detail on in the actual class, then we're going to have a Bible class the next week on what I preached on the last week. So that sounds crazy. Here's, so January 7th, I'm gonna preach on a subject. January 14th, we're gonna have a Bible class in which we discuss that subject. Why is that? Well, part of it is that it has to do with having two services and you know, having a Bible class in the middle and some people get it early, some people get it late. That's not exactly fair. Some of it is that, frankly, this is not a good medium for discussion, right? What I do here is not, a, there's not a great opportunity here for us to talk about things, for you to ask questions. And with stuff that's this important, you need to have the opportunity to discuss and to ask questions. So sermon series to lay some things out and then a follow-up class a week later so that we can talk about it. So that you can take issue with it if you want or say, wait, I need more on this. If, I'm, if this is a core belief, I need a better explanation than the guy gave me last week in the sermon. We need to, I need to see more scripture. That's great. That's how this class is going to be oriented. So eight sermons, eight classes. We have eight different teachers who are going to help teach this. Uh, and so I hope, that, I hope you'll be a part of this. Um, again, starting January 7th with the sermon, January 14th with the Bible class. Um, we're gonna pull our statement of beliefs in there. Some of you may not even know that we have a statement of beliefs as a church. You're gonna see that. You're gonna to get to connect to that and understand where that comes from. And uh, so class-wise on the 14th, we're gonna have one class, all adults in here. Uh, and then after that, we will go back to having multiple classes. Isaac will still have his class in classroom one, Spanish language class. There will be an alternative class in classroom two and three. But anybody who wants to be in here and to learn about the essentials and to discuss the essentials, that's what we'll be doing. Does that make sense? Do you see the importance of that? You, I'm hoping you get to the end of this and you all go, I knew all that. I believe all that. We're good. Chances are, though, there's going to be some stuff in there that mm, you hadn't really thought about in a while. Maybe some things that yeah, maybe you were starting to kind of get a little fuzzy on. And so... You know, this is important, and so we're going to spend some time to do that. So that's the looking ahead part of today's message. Now for the, uh, the looking back part. I mentioned previously, I think the last, uh, you know, I, I, between uh, November and December, spent a lot of time working on, uh, with the Bible class team, putting together curriculum, and spent a lot of time working on sermon calendar for next year and planning out a bunch of, of series for the year. And, you know, as I, look at the, as I looked at my preaching calendar for 2024 and saw all the different things, where I think they kind of fit in um, and what I'm hoping to accomplish next year, I also realized that, you know, I hadn't really looked back over the 2023 sermon calendar in a while. And, and this is funny because I was reminded of something that I, I've noticed over the years about, about my preaching. And it's something I try not to think about too much because it kind of bugs me, but it comes up from time to time. I'm reminded of this. Basically, when I finish a sermon series, when I put a sermon series to bed, I'm so ready to move on to the next thing that I'm just, and I'm sure you are too, like let's do something else for a while, that when we go to the next thing, I, I kind of just push everything I've just talked about just out of my head. And so if you can imagine two, three, four sermon series down the line, I have not given those early series any thoughts since I stopped preaching on them. Not that things don't come up in life and all that. I hope that they do. But, you know, sometimes I, somebody will say something to me about, a, about something from two months ago, and I'll, and I'll honestly, I'll look at them like, did I preach on that? Because I sure don't remember preaching on that. I mean, this happens more, more often than I care to admit. And so I really was thinking about that, and I was looking back over the, the, various, the various series that I preached through in 2023 and kind of forcing myself 
to go back and rehash those messages, forcing myself to go back and think about these things, forcing myself to say, what did you learn preparing these sermons? Did you get anything out of them? Or have you grown as you've been doing the prep work? I had to kind of make myself do it to go back and think through these things. And so what I, I got to thinking, maybe it would be a good time for us to end the year with an exercise I've never actually done in 27 years of preaching here. Maybe it would be good for all of us to think back over this past year, to think back at some of the things that we've talked about together from the pulpit as we have gone through the Word of God and tried to learn and tried to grow. Some of the great truths, I hope, that you have observed from the text as we have talked through these various subjects over the course of the year, I think it would be valuable for us to go back. Again, I'm not gonna do this every year. I've never done it before, but I thought this year, let's do something different. Let's look back over the past year and try to remember the important things that the word of God has laid on us through this one narrow medium in, this, in the course of 2023. So let's do that this morning. I gotta tell you, my general philosophy of preaching is that preaching is, uh, sermons are like a meal. And I don't know uh, in your life if you have a couple of, I have a couple meals in my life that were so memorable that I think back the the people that I was with or the event, maybe it was an anniversary or maybe it was a, a part of a special trip and there was just some meal that was just so unbelievable that 10 years, 20 years later, when, the, when you get together with the people who shared the meal together, you talk about it. You talk about the preparation and everything, how everything was just perfect and the setting and all of that. And I got to tell you that in, in my experience, good preaching is typically not that. I, I admire the people. There are people out there that every week is like a spiritual feast. Every six months later, two years later, you're still talking about some message. In my experience, good preaching is, is not that very often. It's not this one message that is so memorable that it's always going to be sticking in your mind and always going to be coming up again. What good preaching is more like is a steady, balanced diet of good nutrition from the Word of God. And so it's more like week, a week by week, a little bit of nourishment that you get that helps to push you forward and helps you move in the right, in the right direction. Like, like eating good meals every day. I hope you eat a good, healthy diet every day. And that it doesn't bother you that if I said to you, what did you have for lunch yesterday? You probably wouldn't remember. You just know that I ate something good and it got me through the day and it kept me nourished and helped me to grow, right? That's what good nutrition is like. And so that's how I think of preaching. And so uh, I got to say, if the weekly sermon is the only spiritual nourishment that you are consuming, it's better than nothing. Although some weeks maybe we could debate that. But you need more than this. You really do. You might be in trouble if this is all that there is for you. But that weekly meal, when you come and we gather and we worship, and as part of that, we set aside some time to talk about a text from the Word of God and to learn from the Word of God, that weekly meal should help you grow. And it should contribute to your overall spiritual health. I don't know if that's how these messages are working for you. That is my aspiration. That is my intent. And so here is some of the nourishment that I have tried to absorb over the past year, and I hope you have as well. We actually, believe it or not, started 2023 by wrapping up a study of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Do you remember that from a year ago? This is where we still were uh, at the beginning of 2023. And what we spent a lot of time in in that series doing was contemplating what the main character in Ecclesiastes contemplates. He is probably best referred to, believe it or not, as the preacher. He's the voice that is being narrated. And he spends really the the extent of that book talking about nothing less than what in the world is the meaning of life. And so we were contemplating that along with him. And he describes in, in the course of Ecclesiastes how he's tried basically every experience that life has to offer. And frankly, we're kind of shocked when we read the stuff that this guy has been messing around with, the things that he has done. And, but the thing is, he says, this has led me to a profound conclusion, not, not that life is meaningless, because a lot of our translations say meaningless, meaningless, life is meaningless, and we go through our, our heads that that's the idea. Ecclesiastes says life is meaningless. That's not what he says. What he says essentially is that life is more like smoke. Life is vapor. Life is a mist. It is hard to grasp. It is hard to figure out. We don't always know what's going on. And it has meaning, 
But we don't always understand what that meaning is in the moment. We can't always make sense of that meaning in the moment. And so what this means in one sense is that one of the things we should contemplate is that we should live life in pursuit of things that really matter. And this is where we came across this idea of living life backwards. Living life backwards. When you get to the end of your life and you look back over the course of your life, what do you hope that your life had stood for? What do you hope that your life might have accomplished? What, what in your life do you hope will have lasted? What do you hope will have mattered? Whatever those things are that you hope in your life will have amounted to in the end, whatever those things are, whatever, whatever will have given your life real lasting significance after you're gone, live toward those things now. Don't wait till some point in the future to, to prioritize your life and, and do the things that matter someday. Do those things now. Let the end of your life shape your priorities, your goals, your ambitions today. You don't know, none of us knows when the end will come. But while you're still drawing breath, you have a chance to refocus your life on the things that matter. So live life backwards. Live with the end in mind. From Ecclesiastes, we moved into a discussion of, I think, one of the most important yet deceptively simple questions that every one of us really needs to answer in life, that we all do answer on some level. It is the simple uh, yet deep question, who am I? What is my identity? We were inspired in this study by looking at the seven I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospels. And so we spent eight weeks thinking about and talking about Christian identity. The truth is that there are a lot of different ways, a lot of legitimate ways in which you could answer the question, who am I? And if I said to any one of you, hey, tell me, who are you? You would probably start a list, right? And you might start with, well, I'm a husband or I'm a wife. I'm a father or a mother. Things like that. Those things are important. Those things are significant. They matter. Some other things I think, uh, you know, in our identity probably don't actually matter that much. If the first thing that comes to your mind when I say, who are you, is you say, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat, I'm going to tell you that your sense of identity, you're focused on things that don't matter very much. And unfortunately, some of us, I think, lean too much in that direction. But the most important source of our identity has got to be our identity in Christ. There is nothing else that matters as much. The idea that we answer the question, who am I, by saying, well, I am, I am a part of a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I am one of God's special possession, as First Peter reminds us in chapter 2. The idea that we are Christians, that we are part of God's eternal kingdom. I got to tell you, that matters more than your gender. It matters more than your ethnicity. It matters more than your sexuality. It matters more than your politics. It matters more than your passion. It matters more than your possession, profession or anything else, or it should matter more. And so as you head into 2024, what is the most important source of your identity? The most important thing. Other things matter, but nothing matters more than your identity in Christ. This would be a good year to make sure that your answer to the question, who am I, starts with how you stand next to God and your relationship with him. Now, one of the core elements of our identity in Christ is that God loves us as we are, right? He loves us for who we are. He even welcomes us into his kingdom as imperfect people, broken people, sinful people, but he is not content that we should stay that way after he gives us new life. And in fact, he very much wants us, each of us, to change. We don't like the idea that we might have to change. God wants us to change. And so we spend some time in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, looking at first, most importantly, what constitutes a legitimate fruit salad. I hope you remember this conversation. A legitimate fruit salad has no kiwi, no grapefruit, no apple, and it's heavy on the strawberries. So we established that as the baseline. But then we got around, you know, to the stuff that really matters. We saw that what our lives begin to look like when we're being transformed from the sinful people that we were when we met Jesus into people who begin to resemble Jesus. And that is a transformation, nothing less. We are to be people who, who are being transformed or being changed by the power of God's Holy Spirit working in us. It's the only way we can become who God wants us to be. And, and the truth is, even in new life, even with the Spirit working in us, we will still be sinful people. But, but if you go back and you look at that passage in Galatians 5 and you see that list of, of the sinful nature, we become people who are no longer known by, who are no longer known for our sin. Instead, we are known 
for the Christ-like attributes that we begin to take on by the power of the Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self-control, those are the things that begin to identify us as God is transforming us into people who begin to look like Jesus. And last summer, probably we're getting into the part of the year that you maybe start to remember a little more because last summer was our longest series of the year and we focused then on the life of one of the most fascinating and significant people in the Bible. That, of course, is David, who becomes eventually King David. It's hard to, I think, pick one overarching message from David's life and I hope that, I, I gotta tell you, this is the series this year that has just continued to rattle around in my head as I think about life and as I think about who I want to be and who I think God wants me to be and, and challenged by my weaknesses, but also by God's grace. And uh, this series has had an impact on me. Hard to pick one thing from a complicated life, but I think that there are some things that, that we can see here that are emphasized in this text, that despite his colossal failures and sins and weaknesses, God loved David's heart. And that by looking at David's heart, we learn some things about who God is and about what God values and about how God works. So that, for instance, that God values faith in his people. He values love of his word. He values humility and penitence in the hearts of his people. These demonstrate that we understand that, that we know who is God and who is not, that he is and that we are not. David's life emphasizes that God works powerfully and graciously in all the moments of our lives, not just not just, just during the events in our lives that we think of as the good times. David's life emphasizes that God understands our human nature and how we, like David, uh, have talents and abilities, but those can never compensate for our deep flaws and our struggles with sin. And God understands this, and God provides for this. And I think that those are powerful lessons. The things that are most important for us to learn through David's life are the things we learn about the God that we worship. And then more recently, we closed the year with two very short series. We spent a month looking at the, the topic of gratitude from a very specific perspective, which is how powerful gratitude is. We talked about how gratitude is a, a weapon that helps us battle anxiety. Gratitude helps to foster contentment in our lives, which, which helps to kind of uh, keep us from a whole bunch of other sins that we can get sucked into. Gratitude grounds us in the present while also helping us to be conscious of the blessings of the future. Gratitude is powerful. And then finally, we looked at some unlikely heroes in the Bible, starting with Jesus' own mother, Mary, which reminded us that God wants each one of us to play a role in accomplishing his purpose in the world. We are part of the body of Christ. We're part of God's kingdom. Every one of us matters. Everyone is significant in God's mission. God has a place for each of us. And so when you look in the mirror and you think, oh, what can I do? You see nothing but glaring limitations. God instead sees your unique qualifications. Well, that was a very quick trip through 47 sermons. Um, I'm confident that as we have uh, gone through this each week that you have retained everything that we have talked about. I'm confident that each week you go home and you spend the next week just working on, you know, harnessing all this, fixing the things that need fixing, calling on the power of God to work in you so that, so that he can, you know, make up for your deficiencies. Obviously, with this is, uh, you know, life intervenes, right? And I'm embarrassed to, to look back over the course of the year and, and not remember some of the things that I spent a lot of time preparing and delivering. And so I understand uh, how that is for you as well. But I think what this reminds us of, or what it should remind us of, is that in life, God has set a path before us. It is a path of faithfulness. It is a path of discipleship. And as we move down that path in the direction that God wants us to go, what is happening to us is we are moving toward the likeness of Jesus. We are moving in the direction of becoming more like Christ. And this is what God has set before us. As one year ends and another begins, where are you on the path? More importantly, are you, are you moving in the right direction on the path? I gotta tell you, every year reveals, and 2024 is no different, that some of us uh, have sort of left the path. You know, Some of us are kind of off-roading. We're doing our cross-country thing, and we're not maybe even sure anymore where, where the path is, because that's the direction our lives have taken. 
And some of us, you know, we're still on that path, but we look back over the year and we think spiritually, well, I have not really moved forward. I have I've moved back a step or two steps or a mile. Some of us have, have really gone in the wrong direction. I'm thankful to say, you know, the people that, that I talk to and, and am involved in, many of us, I think, are making steady progress in the right direction. And that's, that's pleasing to God. The path of discipleship has not changed. It's still right there in front of us. Where do you want to be on that path when we get to the end of 2024 and we're talking about the next year? I am really thankful to be a part of this church, this, uh, this spiritual community. I am grateful to be here. Uh, this is a church, whether I tell you this often enough, you, you encourage me to try to be more like Jesus. And I am so thankful to be here. I'm so thankful for our elders who shepherd us. I'm so thankful for my coworkers. I'm so thankful for each one of you. Happy New Year. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for counselor comforter keeper spirit we long to embrace you offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way oh we've hopelessly lost our way you are the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh hearts always hunger for almighty infinite father faithfully loving your own here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne oh we're falling before your throne you are the one You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Be seated, please. Good morning. Thank you, Jeff, for that review. I remember that it reminded me when I had a public speaking class in high school. She said, you always organize your presentations with three things. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So you just gave us what you told us for the last year. So I appreciate that. A <clears throat> uh, couple things. Couple, if you haven't gotten a bulletin and read it, please grab one. They're out there on the back. A couple things that were not in the bulletin you should keep in your prayers if you could. Uh, Brenda and Weldon Weinberger, who we know left early December to go spend a few months in the Philippines to visit their son-in-law Sam, have been sick, th sick since they got there. So it's now the 31st, so it's been a long three or four weeks for them. So um, apparently they are slowly getting better, but it has been a long road. So please keep them in your prayer. So, uh, we would appreciate that. And their son-in-law and kids, as of the email earlier, the text earlier this week, also are not feeling well. So um, not much of a family visit when you're really sick. So keep them in your prayers. And also, Rob Orris, who's normally with us for a service, I don't know if you know it, but Rob uh, suffers from MS. He's been doing really well lately, but he had a flare-up this week and has been struggling. So uh, keep uh, Rob in your prayers this week as well. One other thing I just wanted to mention, um, 
as we start to go into January, February, March, and weather can sometimes be dicey, make sure that the information that we have for you, both your email and your cell phone or home number, whatever is your primary way to contact, is up to date. Because if it's Saturday night and we think we're going to get ice all morning and we'd make some cancellations, we've got all kinds of tools to communicate with you. Usually it's a text message, it's a voicemail, it's an email, whatever. Um, but just make sure we have the right information because we'd hate for you to show up and doors be closed and you think we forgot all about you. Um, so classes are normal today with the exception of our young adults, right? So everybody's normal, young adults. Uh, Dan Danielle and Brent are not here this morning. They're leading some stuff up at Camp Manitoni. So with that, if you could close with prayer, please. Dear Lord, we thank you once again for letting us be here. We thank you for the way that you've blessed this congregation, this group of Christians in Lancaster County over the past year. And we pray as we look forward into 2024 that you'll continue to bless us, that we can continue to be open to you being active in our lives, that we can seek your will in all things that we do. As we look forward to what we might expect, we can expect probably turmoil here in this country as we go into politics. There's wars all over the country. There's challenges, and yet, Lord, we are part of your citizenship with you. We just pray that we can continually focus more and more on you and less and less on the things that are around us that can distract us from your word, from your love, and for our challenge here to share others, the news of you with others that we know. We love you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>